So just before we get started, a quick thanks to Brilliant.org who have agreed to sponsor this video. So you might be asking, Drac, why as someone interested in naval history should I be interested in this? Well, as many of you know, I have an engineering background and that has helped me quite considerably in my study of naval history. One of the key points within engineering is unfortunately maths. And one of the fields of maths that is most easily manipulated and quite often very misunderstood is probability and statistics. But when you're trying to work out things like just how frequently did battleships spontaneously explode or where exactly is a shell going to land within a given radius if it's fired from a set of battleship guns of a certain type in a certain layout, well that's where probability and statistics really comes in handy. And with Brilliant.org you can learn a bit more about these things interactively. There's courses at various levels for various things. There's other subjects as well, but I'm obviously looking here at the statistics and the probability modules. And there's plenty of creative problem solving going on within each module. And of course the best part is that you can get started for free. Just head to brilliant.org forward slash Drakinafel and you can get started on these modules or any others that might take your fancy. If you think it's something you'd like to continue with, well then, the first 200 of you who sign up also get 20% off the annual membership, so that's a nice little bonus. So thanks once again to Brilliant for allowing me to buy even more naval photos for the archive, and now back to your regularly scheduled program. Okay, so, you have a dreadnought, maybe you have more than one dreadnought, and you want to modernise that dreadnought. How do you go about it? What pitfalls should you avoid? What things should you perhaps include? This is a question that vexed a lot of people in the 1920s and the 1930s and fortunately for us looking back through the lens of time we can see where some things went right and some things went very very wrong. So with that benefit of hindsight let's consider if you happen to have for whatever reason a dreadnought maybe you've been thrown back in time to the early 1930s or something and you are planning out how to modernize your fleet what factors should you consider? Well, for a start, you have to consider whose fleet are you trying to modernise, because every fleet has slightly different operational requirements. Now, some of those may be influenced by politics and budgetary considerations and are perhaps less relevant to the material and engineering side of what is the best way to modernise a dreadnought to fulfil your Navy's needs, but you do have to keep that kind of thing in mind to a certain extent. But for the most part, we're going to be looking at the purely technical aspects of the matter. Now, of course, the big elephant in the room is why exactly are you modernising old battleships instead of just building new ones? And that pretty much, as you might have guessed from that time period, restricts us to looking at the interwar period. Because, you know, back in the late 19th century, even the first couple of decades of the 20th century, if a ship had gotten too old, such that it was no longer useful in the battle line, then it would just be scrapped, or perhaps relegated to second line duties which it could still fulfil. Or, if you were the Royal Navy and it was 1900, you'd just keep literally everything you'd ever built. Which was a bit silly, and Fisher stopped, but nevertheless... The point was that, generally speaking, you didn't expect a ship that had gone obsolete to be brought back up to full fighting potential on the front lines. You'd simply build a new and improved ship to replace it. But, in the interwar period, that wasn't an option. There was a battleship holiday, and that holiday had been extended. And even once that holiday finished and new battleship construction started there were limits to how quickly you could build ships compared to 1900s or 1910s era industry, simply because everybody's industry had suffered quite considerably through lack of business. The Royal Navy, for example, was faced with a situation where circa 1910, they could quite happily lay down a class of four battleships and a battlecruiser, i.e. five total capital ships a year, plus the shipyard's in question would also be building ships for foreign customers, such as Chile or Turkey, or then the Ottoman Empire, and those shipyards would still be screaming for more work because, well, they had slipways going idle. Then fast forward to the 1930s, and it was considered that perhaps you could build two battleships a year, and maybe you could stretch that to three, 
if certain industries could be boosted. Now granted, capital ships had got somewhat larger and somewhat more complex over the years, but that was largely a matter of finance as opposed to infrastructure, unless you were France, where you were constantly pushing the limits of your slipway sizes with every increasing class of ship, the actual physical size of most reasonable capital ships wasn't the problem. The problem was the industries surrounding those ships, gun manufacture, armour manufacture, the shipyards themselves, had been so neglected over the interwar period there just wasn't the industrial capacity left because a lot of those businesses had either shut down or massively downsized and it's not the kind of thing that you can rebuild quickly. And all of this meant that if you wanted to have a battle fleet worthy of the name by, say, the end of the 1930s, then you were going to have to make some of your older ships a bit more combat capable. Otherwise, you were going to end up with two, three or four modern capable battleships and a bunch of floating targets. So now we know why on earth we're modernising older ships, let's consider the next major factor. What's your base material that you're going to start with? because for most navies, there are a wide range of choices. But broadly, this is on a sliding scale from ships that are currently the least useful to ships that are currently the most useful. Although this does present a bit of an interesting paradox, because you obviously have a ship that is the least useful. For the US, that might be something like USS Arkansas, a 12-inch gun dreadnought, or perhaps Texas and New York, the last non-standard battleships. For the British, it might be something like the Revenge class. For the Japanese, the Fusos, and so on and so forth. Now, as I said, these ships are the least useful in your battle line, so perhaps logic would dictate that modernising them bringing them up to some kind of capable standard would increase the power of your fleet the most. But on the other hand, you have the most capable ships in your battle line. Nelsons, Colorados, Nagatos, etc. And modernising them would lead to the single greatest increase in firepower. After all, a small vessel, relatively speaking, like a New York or a Fuso or a Revenge, can only be upgraded so far. It's already inferior to other older ships, so you might make it slightly superior to those older ships, but it's still going to have a fairly large gulf to go before it reaches anything close to parity with the new ships you've designed. Whereas maybe your bigger, slightly newer ships, maybe they can be upgraded to a point where they're actually full-on competitive, to a certain degree at least, with the latest and greatest that you're building in the mid-1930s. So now the logic seems, well, we should upgrade our latest ships. But then you can turn it on its head again and say, well, yes, if, but if we do that, then we're taking what are currently our most powerful ships, because your newly built ships haven't yet been completed, offline, and thus reducing the most effective units in our fleet, whilst the oldest ships, the ones that are the least useful, will just continue their sailing off into obsolescence to the point there's not really any real reason to keep them around. And that's a relatively simple chain of logic, even though it involves several twists and turns. That's before you get into the precise operational requirements of each individual fleet, which are going to differ for obvious reasons. And finally, of course, you have the fact that in some navies, you simply don't have even that choice. For France, for example, you have the Corbets and the Bretagnes, neither of which are spectacularly competitive compared to pretty much any of the battleships that the big three have kept around. The Italians have the Dorias and the Cavours, which similarly are not exactly world beaters by the mid-1930s. The Russians have the Gangots, which are in pretty much the same boat. So, depending on the navy that you're looking at, you simply might not have a choice. There are only so many ships available to you, so you're just going to have to modernise those and make the best you can of it. And to be clear, in this video we are talking about the full-on modernizations, aka rebuilds, of Dreadnoughts, not so much the updates and refits that were generally done to warships throughout the 1920s and 1930s to try and keep them roughly abreast of current technology. So we've taken age and overall fighting capability into account when we're making our decision as to what we're going to modernize, as well as just flat out what we might have available. You then have to consider the traditional dichotomy of any capital ship, speed, protection, and firepower. 
And each of these has to be considered in terms of how it stacks up with what your navy needs in the mid-1930s, as well as the aforementioned age issues. Now, it's interesting when you look at the three big navies, which are the ones we're primarily going to focus on, although we will also be looking at the Italians for a bit, and not so much the Russians or the Germans because their modernizations and refits were so bound up either by treaty restrictions or extremely active interference by politics that they are more analysis of that particular paradigm rather than anything to do with engineering tactics or common sense. But going back to the big three navies, Japan looked at its pre-existing capital ship fleet made up of Fusos, Iseis, Nagatos and Kongos and found that whilst they had reconstructed the Fusos and Iseis to an extent in the late 20s and early 30s, the priority was going to be the Kongos and Nagatos. This was because in a world of 35,000 ton battleships motoring around at 28 knots with at least 14 inch main armament as standard, the Congos and the Nagatos were the only ones that offered a realistic prospect of being modernised to something approaching a competitive level. The Congos were already fast enough, they in theory had the right size guns, even if not quite as many, so there was something to be made of them, and the Nagatos, whilst a fraction slower, did have a reasonable degree of protection, at least by some standards, but more importantly, they had 16-inch main guns, which gave them the firepower to compete with newer battleships. The main problem with the Fusos and Iseis wasn't so much the armament, although their protection wasn't fantastic by the time of the mid-1930s, it was simply that they were so much slower that any kind of modernization would struggle to bring them up to a useful combat speed, as we'll see later when we consider balances. In the US Navy, they had slightly less variety than the Japanese did, in as much as the majority of the fleet was made up of the standard type of battleship. Now, for the US, they had already concluded that they were going to be replacing their older ships with the new North Carolina and then South Dakota classes, then under construction, and so the oldest ships, Arkansas, New York class, Nevada class, etc., were not slated for any kind of modernization. They would serve until their replacements came online, and that was pretty much that. But they did have what were called the Big Five, the Tennessees and Colorados, which were actually very, very similar ships, even by simple visual appearance, but also in terms of overall design. The main difference being that one had 12 14-inch guns in four triple turrets, and the other had eight 16-inch guns in four twin turrets even though the US Navy would have preferred them all to have eight 16-inch guns in four twin turrets, but the Secretary of the Navy at the time of their construction had stopped them from doing so. Nevertheless, the US fleet at the time had a standard fleet speed of 21 knots, so there wasn't any choice to make in terms of was this ship faster than another, and so it just came down to a simple selection of firepower. The armour was mostly the same for all of them, so the Tennessees and the Colorados, the Big Five, were the obvious choices for modernization because they had the best armament, they were the newest, they had the most potential, and everything else would just be replaced in pretty short order. The British, on the other hand, had perhaps the biggest conundrum. They had a split of armament, like everybody else did, between 15 and 16 inch gun armed ships, but they had a lot of difference in performance between the various classes. They had the Revenge class, which, like a lot of the fleet, had eight 15-inch guns, but they were the smallest and the slowest of all of the British capital ships. You then had the Queen Elizabeth class, which had the same guns, but were a bit faster. Their armour scheme was not quite as well laid out as the Revenge class, which had actually been their immediate successors, but... Overall, their slightly increased size and definitely their somewhat higher speed were deciding factors in prioritising them above the Revenge class. You then had the three battlecruisers, two Renowns and Hood. The Renowns had somewhat less protection than Hood did and two less guns and were somewhat older. But at the same time, Hood was the third most modern capital ship in the Royal Navy fleet, and it was a big status symbol, it was seen as quite important, and it was generally thought that maybe Hood could hold its own for a few more years. 
Thus, the Renown class also went on the list as possible modernization candidates. And then lastly, you had the Nelson class, which kind of sat at a midway point. The battle cruisers obviously being very fast, the Queen Elizabeth being somewhat fast, the Revengers being slow, and the Nelsons as battleships sitting between the Queen Elizabeth and the Revengers in terms of speed. They were the best protected, and in theory had the heaviest armament with nine 16-inch guns, but like Hood, they were considered relatively modern and therefore the most combat capable, and thus it was decided that they would be modernised somewhat later. Thus, the Royal Navy decided to start modernisations with the Queen Elizabeth class and the Renown class. If nothing else intervened, which of course historically it did, they would continue with Hood and the Nelsons, but the Revengers would be discarded as the King George V's and Lions came online. And the Italians were the most boxed in. They had the Andrea Dorias and the Conte de Cavour class, so if they wanted to modernise ships, those were their only choices, take or leave. What you might have detected in the navies at least that had a choice in the matter, i.e. the Japanese and the British, is that speed was a significant concern. It's fairly obvious why modern battleships were going to be going at at least 28 knots. So if you were going to go through the trouble of modernising an old capital ship to keep up with them, well, then you should either make that ship as fast faster or at least somewhat close to the speed of the new ships that they'd be operating with. There were also aircraft carriers to consider. If you were going to escort them, you would need to be moving at a fair old clip because, well, the carriers did. Where speed wasn't an option, then firepower became the priority because, you know, bigger, newer ships with more armour and heavier guns would need the biggest guns you could have to counter them. But overall armour protection, at least in terms of the choice of the ship that you're taking in for modernisation, doesn't appear to have had that much of an influence on things. Otherwise, things like the Congos and the Renowns certainly wouldn't have been top of the list. So now you have a rough idea how historically everybody looked at things. Let's look at what you can actually do with a mid-1930s dreadnought modernisation, assuming that you've got 1910s-early 1920s stock to work with. Well, in terms of speed, the efficiency and pressures of steam plants for powering your turbines have advanced, so you can replace the machinery. This is probably a good idea generally anyway, as shipborne machinery tends to have approximately a 20-year service lifespan, somewhat shortened if it's put to wartime use for extended periods, obviously, and somewhat lengthened if the ship spends some time in reserves not doing anything. But by the mid-1930s, pretty much all the ships that you might consider for modernisation will likely either be in desperate need of machinery modernisation and replacement, or they'll be coming up to it anyway. This was a problem that would dog Hood, because she had been launched at the very end of the 1910s, commissioned in the very, very early part of the 1920s, and so by 1940-41, her machinery was pretty much on its last legs. So what does this mean? Well, it means that if you wish to replace the machinery but keep the same speed for the ship, assuming you haven't changed the dimensions or displacement or hydrodynamics of the ship all that much, which is something we'll come to a bit later, you can get the same amount of horsepower using much less machinery. So you will have a lot of spare space and less machinery also means less weight, so you're saving displacement for other things. Alternatively, you could replace the machinery like for like, using the same amount of weight, the same amount of volume, only, of course, using much more powerful, more modern machinery, you could make your ship go a lot, lot faster. Or you could strike a balance in between, maybe getting a small speed boost in exchange for not saving quite as much volume and weight, but still saving some. Now, there are a few other factors that might affect your overall ability to increase speed, the length to beam ratio of the ship is a very crude one. The Italians, for example, would add bow extensions to their ship modernizations in order to provide for an increased level of speed. Hydrodynamics is another. Obviously, adding a bow extension will also affect the overall hydrodynamic profile of the ship underwater. But 
you've also got, verging on the protection issue, the issue of torpedo defences. Older ships don't really have that much in the way of torpedo defence against modern 1930s World War II era torpedoes. So in some cases you might want to either alter or upgrade or add to the existing defences. Usually this is done in the form of bulges, which of course affect your underwater profile. And so you might end up having to increase the overall horsepower output of your machinery plant just to remain at the same speed if you've made the ship wider underwater by adding bulges, for example. So you might not get all the weight and volume savings that you might want if you are determined to just keep at roughly the same speed as before. And of course, with that saved weight and saved volume, you can use those areas for other things. The weight, for example, could go on additional protection or firepower. The volume could go on supplying that additional protection or firepower or indeed improving your endurance, which ties into speed because you could convert that spare space in to fuel bunkers, into magazines, into other forms of storage, or whatever else you might choose to do. But precisely which choice you make when it comes to the overall speed and therefore the amount of machinery you're going to be putting into your modernised ship largely depends on what you want to do with that ship. For example, a battleship if it's capable of something approaching an acceptable speed, like say 25 knots in the case of the Queen Elizabeths, you might want to just maintain that speed. If your ship is so slow that any increase in speed isn't really going to help its cause that much, like say a Colorado class, well then you have two choices. You can either take the Italian approach of radically redesigning and rebuilding the entire ship's hull and upgrading the machinery, in which case you might very well get a fairly respectable speed out of it, such as the Italians did succeed in doing, turning their 21-ish knot ships into 27-ish knot ships. But that's an awful lot of time and expense where you might actually want to put that time and expense into other things. So it's a choice that you have to make. The other one, of course, is ships that are already relatively quick, like the Renowns or the Congos. If it's fast enough to do what you want, whether that's keep up with carriers, keep up with cruisers, etc., then you probably just want to maintain that, maybe round a knot or two up a bit. Whereas if you're in a slightly awkward position, such as, say, the Congos, which were approximately capable by the 1930s of keeping up with existing fast battleship designs that were under construction, but obviously have the disadvantage of being battle cruisers, it is perhaps understandable that you might want to amp the speed up just on that basis, let alone if you want to operate it with carrier groups. But exactly how far you take it will depend on the balance of the other two factors. Protection is the next one. Now, with protection, you have three main elements to consider. You have the ship's belt armour, protection against incoming shells. You have the ship's deck armour, which is protection against incoming plunging shell fire. But to be honest, by the mid to late 1930s, you're probably thinking more in terms of protection against bombs, which will incidentally hopefully also protect against shells. And then you have your underwater protection against torpedoes. Now, we've already discussed torpedo defence systems to a certain degree but due to their potential effect on speed. But it is a fairly important thing to consider because, oddly enough, adding torpedo defence systems in the form of bulges will increase your displacement overall because you're adding weight to the ship, but might actually cause your ship to ride slightly higher in the water because, of course, all of this is underwater and hopefully sealed, apart from the liquid-filled sections, and thus the buoyancy of the ship and its waterline might actually go up unless you add weight that correspondingly forces the ship further down, but, you know, that's your choice. The one thing I definitely wouldn't advise is not doing anything with your torpedo defence system, because the odds of being hit by a torpedo in the late 1930s in any theoretical conflict are significantly higher than the chances of being hit by a torpedo in World War One. So you do need some extra protection against that, especially considering the, that torpedoes have become significantly more dangerous in terms of their explosive payload, as well as things like range and frequency. Now, as already mentioned, you could do this by simply adding bulges to enhance the existing torpedo defence systems, or you could take the Italian approach of 
developing an entirely new torpedo defence system and ripping out the old one and installing the new one. Now, at some point you begin to cross the line from modernisation to complete rebuild, but, ship of Theseus arguments aside, staying just this side of you know physically rebuilding the entire ship, it is just about possible to do. But you also have to consider that within the confines of the ships you're working with, bearing in mind that they are going to be, for the most part at least, somewhat smaller than a modern 35,000 ton capital ship, there is only a limited amount of volume that you can occupy with a torpedo defence system. And volume and depth are really the single biggest factors when it comes to torpedo defence, as experience, even by that point, had already shown. So, whilst improving your torpedo defence is definitely a thing to do, exactly how you do that is kind of down to just how much money you want to spend. A lot of ships would just receive bulges or some variation thereof. Then you've got your belt armour. Now, depending on the ship that you're modernising, you may have a slightly easier or slightly harder time of things. If your ship has already been built to the all-or-nothing paradigm, then great, you don't have to do too much, because the ship's main belt is pretty much the entirety of the major armour on the ship's side, and that's what you want. On the other hand, it can also be a bit of a negative, because there isn't really a lot to remove, whereas with a distributed armour scheme, you can make a fairly good argument for removing or replacing sections of mid-grade armour, that are no longer necessary. And of course, if you do that, you will end up with spare displacement, which you can use to improve other things, which is good. Now, the big elephant in the room, do you improve the main belt armour, the armour that's protecting your ship's citadel? This is a big question to ask, because that is going to be difficult and expensive. You can't just slap, say, a two to three inch plate of armor steel over the top of your existing belt armor and hope to have anything close to the effectiveness that your on-paper thickness would actually give you. This is for a number of reasons. One, laminated armor doesn't work anywhere near as effectively as sheer single blocks of armor when it comes to resisting heavy grade naval gunfire when you're using steel. But secondly, because as you will have seen hopefully from the armor video, by this point, armor steel is face hardened with a gradiated face going down towards a softer back. Simply slapping an additional layer of steel over the top of that pretty much ruins the gradiation that you're going for, even if you use an external plate of incredibly hard steel to mimic the external face. So if you're going to be upgrading your main belt armour, this is probably either going to be in the shape of removing an upper strake of thinner armour, as was proposed in one of the ideas for Hood's refit, and replacing it with a similar thickness of armour to the main strake. Thus, you have the same armour thickness as your maximum, only over a wider area. Or, if you absolutely have to, just removing the armour entirely and replacing it with much thicker plating. Now, this was actually done in a few cases in cruisers and such like, and of course much earlier with the Renown class, where they originally had 6-inch belt armour and it was replaced with 9-inch belt armour. But it is a fairly big undertaking. It's going to involve a relatively substantial increase in weight, it will slightly alter the underwater profile of the ship because some of that belt armor will be underwater. So you are going to have to consider that into your design equation. And of course, you have to also assess the effectiveness of the effort versus the cost involved. So, for example, if you are upgrading a Queen Elizabeth or a standard type battleship with 13 to 13 and a half inches of main armor thickness, well, 13 inches, it's not the most armour that you might find on a modern battleship. It's maybe not the most armour that you might find on a modern battleship if you consider the effectiveness of the scheme, because early dreadnoughts, the kind of things you'll be upgrading, are probably going to have slab-sided armour. Some of the newer ships might be launching with theoretically slightly thinner armour plate, 
but it might be angled to increase its overall effectiveness, certainly at any kind of appreciable range. But, on the other hand, a lot of the ships that you might be modernising will have been designed with the idea of facing off against 14, 15 or 16 inch guns. And whilst somewhat modernised, most of the treaty designs that you will probably be facing off against will also have 14, 15 or 16 inch guns, depending on whether they're escalator clause ships or if they're perhaps flouting the treaty somewhat, but the calibers are still roughly the same. Now, as we said, penetration figures may have improved because you might be looking at higher velocity weapons, but if you've designed a ship with armour against, say, a 15-inch gun and you're now facing a slightly more powerful 15-inch gun, well, you'll probably still have a degree of protection, albeit just at slightly longer ranges, but then the combat's probably going to happen at slightly longer ranges anyway. So... Whilst there may be a margin wherein your armour doesn't afford protection against the enemy's shells, but their armour might afford protection against your shells, if that margin is perhaps in a relatively inconvenient range that neither side particularly wants to fight at, and it is a relatively narrow one, then the chances of you potentially running into that particular action versus the time, cost and expense of removing the ship's entire side protection system and replacing it with a thicker one, which you're going to then obviously have to manufacture at great expense, that trade-off may not necessarily be the best, especially when you have other ships to armour. And of course, you know, you that is designing against the worst case scenario because there's a lot of either unmodernized or potentially just about being modernized capital ships out there whose guns will not necessarily be as powerful as a modern high velocity or super heavy shell firing weapon which therefore is going to be in the minority of potential scenarios you might face the other factor you have to consider in this respect is whether or not it's feasible to increase the armor to a point that it actually matters so as I say, 13 to 13.5 inches of armour, increasing that to 14 or maybe even 15 inches of armour, it has a benefit, but it might be marginal. Whereas if you increase, say, 9 inch armour to 10 or 11 inches of armour, the overall increase in weight might be about the same, but to be perfectly honest, facing off against a modern battleship gun or a World War One vintage 14, 15 or 16 inch weapon, that thickness of armor is probably not going to provide any real additional protection over the 9 inch armor. I mean, sure, it'll provide a little bit, but you have to compare the effective battle ranges and where this additional protection is coming from. Because if, let's say your 9-inch armour against a theoretical threat will only protect you if you're beyond 35,000 yards and increasing it to 11 inches will protect you down to 32,000 yards. Well, great, considering that you're probably not going to hit anything much beyond the high 20s of thousands of yards and your battle ranges are considerably less than that, you're basically adding weight for no purpose. And adding weight for no purpose in your armour is going to detract from weight you could be putting elsewhere that might help you not be in that situation, such as maybe increasing your speed so you can get away, or increasing your deck armour protection for the occasional long-range hit, or being bombed, or so on and so forth. So it's not just a case of, can you allocate some displacement to increasing your armour, it's also, is it actually worth doing? But consolidating armour from previous distributed schemes in order to both free up displacement and potentially beef up the overall coverage of your main belt thickness, that's definitely a thing to do. Then you have your deck armour. Well, considering that you're working with World War One era stock, the chances are that your deck is not spectacularly thick. It could be hilariously thin, it could be alright, but considering the risks you're going to be facing in a late 1930s or World War II era environment, you are going to want to address this quite substantially. And this is going to be in two ways. Now, fortunately, most deck armour doesn't have face hardening, so you can stack additional thicknesses of armour on top of your previous deck armour if you want to. Again, granted, it's not going to be necessarily as effective as a single thickness piece because of the lamination effect, 
but it's a lot closer than it is going to be if you're trying to improve your belt armor. Now, working with your existing main armor deck, the one that was designed for World War One era gunfire, that will increase your protection against plunging shell fire, which may well be a concern given the ranges of combat you will now be expecting. But the other thing that it's going to do is provide a substantially greater protection against bombs. Now you have to consider that there are obviously numerous kinds of bombs that might be dropped on you, but broadly speaking you've got the high explosive or general purpose types and then the armor piercing types. Now for the armor piercing types you just want as thick as deck as possible and the kind of five inch plus thickness of deck that you're probably going to want to withstand plunging shell fire is probably just as good against uh, armor piercing bombs anyway but you have to also consider the fact there may be some pretty substantial armor piercing bombs out there you know 2200 pounder ones for example and even a five inch deck might not stop them and where the armor deck is positioned on most older ships and to be honest even on a lot of the newer ships is part way down through the hull now that's because that armor deck has to cap off the belt and the belt doesn't go all the way up to the upper decks but what that does mean is that you might end up with a fairly substantial bomb quite a way into your ship before it detonates even if it detonates on the armor deck and if it either forces spalling from the armor deck or if it goes through there's not a lot of distance relatively speaking between that point of detonation or penetration and the vital stuff you're trying to protect like magazines and engines you also have to consider that you're going to have less well-protected parts of your ship like your anti-aircraft battery, possibly some forms of cabling, your secondary battery, which may very well be part of your anti-aircraft battery if it's got dual-purpose guns, and all sorts of other somewhat important sections of the ship, if not necessarily vital to a surface-to-surface -surface gunnery action. All of these things might well be above this armoured deck. And so even a general purpose or high explosive bomb that can penetrate relatively unopposed down to this level, even if it stands basically no chance of getting through your armoured deck, could still cause quite a lot of havoc and a degradation of your overall fighting capability. And so you also, if you don't already have one, need to invest in what would be called a bomb deck for the most part. Or you, if you have one, you might want to improve it. Now this is a thinner section of deck armor higher up possibly even as high up as the upper deck of the ship itself the purpose of this is not really to stop anything although a one and a half inch maybe pushing two inch thick bomb deck might stop a small general purpose one like a 500 pounder or 250 pounder but as i said broadly speaking it's not intended to stop a lot of bombs except for as we said the contact detonation types what it is intended to do however is to initiate the fusing on those bombs because a heavy say base fused high explosive shell or high explosive or general purpose bomb might just about get through that and a bigger one say a thousand pounder 750 pounder or greater might go through anyway but with the fuse initiated that means it's going to detonate higher in the ship if it detonates higher in the ship it therefore can do less damage to you than something that's gotten deeper it's fairly obvious and when it comes to armor piercing weapons especially the heavier bombs again it's not going to stop them but what it will do is initiate the fuse because it's a substantial enough chunk of metal to do that which means that in the absolute worst case at least that fuse is going to run out again higher in the ship ideally not in your machinery spaces or magazines but it's also going to slow down the incoming bomb somewhat so its armor penetration capability is going to be lessened by the time it gets to your main armor deck and thus improves your main armor deck's chance of rejecting the bomb entirely and on top of that of course even though bombs are fairly substantial and fairly durable weapons plunging through an inch and a half to two inches of steel is probably still going to do some damage to it so it's also going to degrade its armor penetration capability in that respect so the bomb deck is an incredibly useful bit of kit the other thing of course is with plunging shell fire it might have a similar effect on incoming shells albeit that shells actually hitting the upper deck of the ship is a slightly 
reduced chance as opposed to shells just hitting the main armor deck generally where they might come in through the upper parts of the ship's side as well and that's a secondary bonus though but you will want both so if you have a thin shell deck on your upper deck or you don't have much beyond just standard deck plating invest in your bomb deck or upgrade it and also upgrade your main uh, deck armor on your main armor deck but this is going to be where a lot of weight goes sometimes it's not quite appreciated that when you're increasing your deck armor you will end up using a lot more weight than you will for your belt even though your belt might be 12 13 14 inches thick or however much if you're a battleship if your deck armor is three four inches thick and you want to upgrade it to five or six inches thick there's an awful lot of weight going into that and the reason for that is surface area because yes a belt may be very thick comparatively and it might be very long but the deck is going to have to cover roughly the same amount of length because you know it's all protecting the citadel but the belt might only be 10 12 15 foot high maybe a bit more maybe a bit less it depends on how well built your ship was in the first place but therefore once you add up the area so width by height and then multiply through by thickness for volume it, there's a fair amount there but compared to the deck where if your ship is say 90 foot plus uh, on the beam at the widest point you're now talking about the same length but instead of 10 15 20 foot you're talking 90 to 100 feet so about five times or more the total width now if you're armor belt is as we said before maybe let's say 13 inches thick and you want to make your armor deck five or six inches thick well that's about roughly speaking around about 40 percent as thick so if you turn that around that's about two and a half times thickness so the armor belt is two and a half times thicker than your deck but if your deck is five times wider and they're the same length you're actually going to have a lot more weight in your deck armor and because of that greater surface area as you increase the thickness of that deck an awful lot of weight is added so this is where you see an awful lot of increase in weight in pretty much all the modernizations and it's something you're going to have to take an incredibly detailed account of because you might be saving weight on machinery you might be saving weight on redistributing your main belt armor but you are going to gain a lot of weight improving your deck armor and there are a few other things which we're going to cover in a minute which also require additional weight. Then you get firepower. This can broadly be divided into four categories. Your main armament, your secondary armament, your anti-aircraft armament, and then the systems that allow you to utilize that armament. Now, in terms of the main armament itself, there's usually not all that much you can do to increase the firepower of the ship when you're modernizing it. In theory, yes, you could swap the guns for something larger, but let's face it, it's World War One era technology, which means that for the most part, you're probably working with ships with twin turrets anyway, unless you're the US, you have triples. But the cost of ripping out the barbette, the turrets, the shell handling systems, etc., and replacing them with twin 16s in the case of US standards, it's probably really not worth it what you can do and the reason why it's not worth it in a lot of cases is because you can do a number of other changes that might improve the overall firepower of your ship one of them is increase the elevation uh, ranges back in world war one were not considered to be as long so the guns could only elevate so far they're perfectly capable of firing shells further if they're given a little bit more elevation and this is what you see quite a lot japanese refits on the congos the refits to war spite renown Queen Elizabeth and Valiant etc etc all of these involve increasing the elevation so you cut crudely speaking cut slightly larger gaps in your turret face so the guns can go up further you might need to increase the depth of the gun pit as well where the um, recoil is going to take the gun when you fire it but that gives you an increase in range which is an effective increase in firepower because you couldn't hit ships at that distance in the first place before so now you can so well and good 
Yes, in theory, you can bore out the guns if your analysis reckons it'll take it to slightly increase the caliber, which is what the Italians did with their 12-inch guns. But that is very much a move of desperation because you have no other choice and the gun that you have already really doesn't stack up. Ideally, if you have any choice at all, you wouldn't have chosen a ship with that armament in the first place. But, as we said before, the Italians didn't have a choice. The other things you can do is you can introduce new shell types, uh, perhaps new propellants, so your shells maybe hit harder or hit more efficiently, more effectively, and combine that with an increased elevation, you can improve the overall lethality of your shells. But that's your main armament. Indeed, like with the Italians, if you want to save enough weight to do other things, perhaps even some volume, you might have to sacrifice some of your main armament in order to allow you to introduce some of the other upgrades. So with the main guns, you can improve their effectiveness, but you're probably not going to improve substantially anything like caliber or number of guns. Then you have the secondary battery. Now, a lot of this depends on what kind of secondary battery you've got. If you're lucky, you might have some kind of turreted armament already, um, in the case of maybe some of the Italian ships, or indeed uh, if you're doing a later period ship, like if you're trying to modernize something like Nelson. But generally speaking, you've probably got a ship that's got casements. Now, you will want to get rid of those, because casement guns, especially at higher speeds, tend to be unworkable. Um, they're a bit low in the ship, so they don't have the greatest range, and it's also very difficult to increase their overall range, because they have vertical limits due to their positioning within the hull, or possibly, if you're a US ship, within the superstructure. Plus, the guns themselves may be somewhat old. Ideally, if at all possible, you want dual-purpose secondary armament, which is another reason to replace the old stuff, because the old stuff is very much single-use. You're not getting any anti-aircraft-like elevations out of a casement battery, let me assure you. Well, you might do if the ship's already halfway on its side, but then you have bigger problems to worry about. Now, when you're replacing casement guns with dual-purpose guns, you do have a bit of a trade-off. The dual-purpose deck-mounted guns, whether they be in turrets or in mounts, will usually cost you a little bit more weight and a little bit more impact on your stability. They're higher up, uh, they've got a whole mounting system to go with them instead of just a gun shield and pivot mounting, which a casement mounted gun would do, but because they have a much greater field of fire, you actually can bring roughly the same number of guns to bear on any given angle with fewer guns. So it kind of balances out. And you look at some of the casement batteries on World War One era ships, you'll quite easily see that some of the foremost and rearmost guns cannot possibly hope to bear much, if at all, in the opposite direction. So on a broadside, sure, you might get all of them, but the minute the angle changes at all, you're going to be start to lose some of those casement-mounted guns' fields of fire. Not so much the case with a turret or mounted weapon on the deck, where... Absolute worst comes to worst, as long as the blast effects aren't too bad, you can fire over other mountings, at least for longer ranges. Plus, of course, dual-purpose armament gives you an increased anti-aircraft battery, indeed a heavy anti-aircraft battery, which is going to be effective at the longest range that you can manage when it comes to taking out all those pesky new aircraft. And if you're ultra-lucky, advances in gun-making technology might mean that the guns you're installing are somewhat lighter. Or indeed, you might be using lighter guns, period. So, for example, if you're in the US, you might have a fairly long barrel 5-inch gun, which is your anti-surface secondary in a standard battleship, but you're replacing it with a 5-inch 38, which is a much shorter barreled weapon, so the gun itself weighs a bit less, which helps offset some of the weight gains from other issues. If you're refitting, well, all of the British refits except for Warspite, you're using 4.5-inch guns instead of 6-inch guns, which, again, 4.5-inch gun weighs less. It's therefore going to save you a bit of weight, offsetting the fact that you're putting turrets on, which are going to increase the weight. Warspite is kind of a halfway house where you get some open-mounted 4-inch AA, but retain some of the casement-mounted 6-inch. It's not the best solution, but Warspite was the earliest full modernization that the Royal Navy tried in the mid-1930s, so it was kind of a learning curve anyway.
Now it does help here if you actually have an effective dual purpose anti-aircraft mount like the 4.5 inch or the 5 inch 38. Um, if you're the Japanese, well, sorry. But given the threat of aircraft in the mid to late 1930s and of course going into World War II, you're definitely going to want a lot of anti-aircraft weapons. So once you've replaced your secondary battery, you now have to think about your dedicated anti-aircraft battery. Now, again, you're probably working with a World War One era ship. If you're lucky, you might have had a scattering of three inch guns on its original form and maybe through various upgrades in the 1920s, you've picked up a few more of some description, but you're going to want to effectively remove them all and replace them outright with lightweight and medium weight anti-aircraft weapons. So you're talking roughly 20 millimeter guns, although if it's the mid 1930s, that might also be 50 cal machine guns and then heavier medium weight guns, so a 37 or 40 millimeter weapon is a pretty good bet for that. Now, granted, for a mid to maybe late 1930s modernization, the full scale of the kind of air threat you'd face in World War II is not necessarily going to be appreciated, so you're not going to be slapping 60, 80, 120 barrels onto the ship the way some of the World War II era modernizations, as was done to many of the US standards after Pearl Harbor, would do. But you are still going to have to have some of this and of course you can then make a choice of do you want numerous single or twin mountings or do you want fewer quad or if you're the British and you have pom-poms even octuple mountings. It's a sliding scale of effectiveness, weight and locational availability but definitely make sure you do so. Now of course because your ship is probably going to come with minimal to no light to medium anti-aircraft battery all of this is going to be additional weight and it's all going to affect your stability as well because it's somewhat high up in the ship. You've also got to consider that all those guns need crews, so they need places to stay, they need food, etc. So all of this is going to impact on your internal volume, where you're going to store the supplies, where you're going to put the crew, are you going to make everyone tighten up, are you going to install new mess decks, etc. And this may factor into what you're doing with some of the space you might have saved from, say, reducing your machinery space. And then you get the delightful factor of all the fire control systems that go with it, because the fire control systems for your main guns have probably improved dramatically. You might have a 10 or 15 foot rangefinder as a relic from your World War One era days, but now 25, 30 foot or even larger rangefinders are available. So, of course, again, more weight and stability somewhat offset by removing the old stuff, but it is an increase. You might also want to install some fire control systems for your secondary batteries. Now, you might have had those originally, but again, better, longer range capable versions are available, of course, again, at a weight and stability penalty. And if they're dual purpose weapons, as they should be, then you also need an anti-aircraft control facility or several because you need to engage multiple threats from multiple angles. Again, more weight, more effect on stability. And if you're being really generous, you might even want to include some form of fire control system for your light to medium anti-aircraft weaponry beyond there's plane, point at plane, pull trigger. Now with all of that in mind, hopefully you're beginning to see why the most obvious thing, as it might seem, increasing your ship's speed, perhaps wasn't done as much, if at all, in the various historical modernizations. Because saving weight and volume by reducing the overall amount of machinery whilst retaining the same speed is pretty much the only major weight saving you're going to get when it comes to modernizations. Indeed, a lot of those spaces that were created in historical refits were turned into magazines for your new anti-aircraft guns, amongst other things. With protection, you might gain a little bit of stability and a little bit of buoyancy if you bulge the ship, but broadly, between increasing your deck armour, potentially increasing the coverage of your be citadel belt, and reducing extraneous armour, your protection levels are going to have a net neutral, approximately speaking, effect on your overall displacement. There may be a slight reduction, there may be a slight increase, more than likely a slight increase, but overall the effect is not as massive. Firepower, though, as we've just considered, is pretty much just going to have a significant increase in your overall displacement from the weight of all the guns and all the additional crew you're adding, and it's also going to affect your stability because a lot of this weight is going to be quite high up. And thus, 
unless you want your ship to be now sitting really, really low in the water and not really able to go anywhere, you're not going to be having massive ambitions towards breaking speed limits compared to what you could do before, because all that space and volume is going to be needed to counteract all the additions you've just made. Hence why the Queen Elizabeth refits, for example, could make about the same speed, maybe just a fraction more than they could originally. So 24 and a half, 25 knots. The standards pretty much stayed at 21 knots. The Nagatos, to be honest, didn't really see a massive change in their speed. Some modernizations even slightly dropped speed. The only ones that really substantially increased their speed were the Italians, the Dorios and Cavours, and the Congos. With the Dorios and the Cavours, they're almost a special case because, as we mentioned, you know, they really didn't have much choice of what to work with, and they also underwent the most substantial transformations, with you know, entire new bow sections being welded on, an entire main battery turret and all its ancillary systems being removed, etc., etc. Which kind of leaves the only one that had an opportunity for a balanced upgrade being the Congos, and the Congos, you know, they ramped their speed up, they increased their overall firepower levels, and they didn't do all that much with their armour. Now, there were reasons for that. They wanted them to be able to keep up with the carriers, they wanted them to be able to keep up to a certain degree with the cruisers and destroyers, the additional mobility granted by the speed was useful, but then on the other hand, apart from Kirishima, because let's face it, nothing was going to save her, when you consider the fates of the other Congos, well, I think you can make a pretty decent argument that spending some of that displacement and volume on improving the ship's protection systems a bit more substantially probably would have benefited them a lot more than being able to travel three or four knots faster than they had previously. And then, of course, you have other equipment, because radios are definitely a thing. So they're going to add more weight because radio technology has advanced. There's a lot more of them. And then as time goes on, depending on exactly when you're doing your refit, in 1935, radar, not really a concern. In 1940, very much a concern. So new radar and further fire control systems are going to be added, which, again, is going to have a stability impact and a weight impact. You might also look at aircraft facilities. Again, this is a bit of a sliding scale. There's a little bit of exchange going on because in 1935, as we said, you're not really thinking about radar, but you will be thinking about installing aircraft. Whereas by perhaps 1940 or 1942, you won't be installing aircraft or you might even be removing aircraft in exchange for putting in radar. It's not that likely you'll have a substantial aircraft complement and a substantial radar installation, although it is possible. But either way, you're adding weight, and because of its location in the ship, you're also affecting your stability once more. And that's just some of the headline systems. So, what exactly is the right balance when it comes to modernising your dreadnought? Well, the answer is that there is no one answer. Again, looking back at the most well-known refits and modernisations, you can see the different priorities coming through. We won't go over the Congos again because we've just done so, but when you look at the refits of the Colorados, the Tennessees, and even the New Mexicos and other standards that the US was forced to modernise in World War II, having already planned to modernise the Big Five as we mentioned, they just wanted to keep speed up. They weren't even necessarily that concerned if speed dropped off just a fraction because a 21-knot ship or a 20-and-a-half-knot ship much of a muchness when compared to the mobility of 28 to 30 or 33 knot ships like the new battleships or aircraft carriers but what they did want to do was improve their protection against incoming torpedoes having well learned that lesson quite painfully at Pearl Harbor and thus installing quite significant bulges and then improving the ship's ability to fight with its guns so elevation on the main guns was increased deck armour was increased, anti-aircraft batteries just went completely crazy, and all the fire control and radar systems necessary to operate them all went in. So in that case, if you look at the speed protection firepower triangle, you could say firepower became the single greatest priority, followed by protection and then speed in a distant third. That made sense, 
in order to create durable platforms that could go out and be used in the island hopping assaults, shore bombardment and guarding fleets against incoming incursions rather than going out and hunting down the enemy in open battle. Then you look at the modernizations of something like the Queen Elizabeth's or the Renown's. In that case, again, firepower pretty much took a front row seat, although it was much more closely matched in terms of armor protection increases, albeit some of that was making up for the fact that, unlike the standards, the British ships had not been designed with the all-or-nothing scheme in mind in the first place. But they were looking to eke out maybe just a fraction more speed than they had before as well. Whereas, as we said, the Americans didn't necessarily care too much if they dropped a half a knot or so. And that's because they were starting with slightly faster ships. The theoretical 25 knot Queen Elizabeths, albeit more like 24 before refit. And, of course, 30 plus knots on the Renowns. And thus keeping that speed and thus keeping the operational flexibility, or maybe just bumping up a fraction, was of somewhat greater importance. And this emphasis makes sense when you consider what those ships were used for. They were used in active frontline roles in the Mediterranean, in the North Sea, later on in the Pacific. So if you are seeking battle, it makes more sense to be mobile so you can actually force the battle or at least somewhat keep up with the enemy battle line units. And then, of course, you have the Italian special case where they absolutely have to prioritise speed because they want ships capable of keeping up with at least somewhat the rest of their battle fleet, and it's the only things they have. Their existing ships are slow, and so they have to put a huge amount into increasing the ship's speed, as a result of which the ship's armour and otherwise other elements of their protection are not substantially increased, and their firepower in terms of barrel count actually drops, and they have to resort to boring out the guns to try and bring that up just a fraction. Now, as we said, granted, it, it, give, it did give them 27 not battleships, albeit ones that even the Italians acknowledged were still very much second line. They were just second line ships that could keep up with the rest of the fleet. So, with all that said, hopefully you can understand the pitfalls, the restrictions, and the reasons for why so many navies modernised their battleships from World War I vintage to something that could serve in World War II in so many different ways. And maybe if you take that away, factor in your own balances and preferences and what ships you might be starting with, whether you want to think about a fully modernised New York or a fully modernised Nelson or something else entirely, maybe you can even make the Corbets frontline combatants, although I won't be holding my breath on that one. Maybe this can help guide you in coming up with your own ideas on either how you might refit a ship to serve in World War II, one that wasn't refitted, or maybe how you would have done a refit or modernization differently for one that was. In any case, I hope you enjoyed the video. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.